In the dim glow of ancient fires, where shadows flickered and danced, there lived women who carried the whispers of the earth in their hearts. They were the enchantresses, feared and revered, misunderstood yet sought after. These women were not mere mortals, they were woven into the very fabric of ancient societies, their presence a thread that connected the world of the living with the mysteries of the unknown. In the small, forgotten corners of villages, in the hidden groves of sacred forests, these women wielded a power that could both heal and harm. They knew the secrets of the herbs, the chants that could call forth spirits, and the rituals that could change the course of fate. People came to them in the dead of night, seeking cures for their ailments, answers to their deepest fears, and protection from the unseen forces that lurked in the dark. Their hands, weathered by time and knowledge, held the keys to life and death, and in those moments, they were more than just women, they were conduits of something far greater. Yet, this power came with a price. The enchantresses walked a fine line between reverence and fear, between love and hate. To be an enchantress was to live on the edge of society, to be both cherished and shunned. The same villagers who sought their help would whisper behind their backs, spinning tales of dark magic and unholy packs. The air around them crackled with tension, for everyone knew that these women could summon the wrath of the gods or the fury of nature with a single word. But why were these women so feared? What was it about their power that both fascinated and terrified? The answer lies in the very nature of witchcraft itself. In ancient times, witchcraft was more than just a set of rituals or spells. It was a way of life, a connection to the world that was both physical and spiritual. It was a force that could not be easily controlled or understood, and those who wielded it were seen as walking between worlds, their feet in this one, but their souls reaching into the beyond. Witchcraft was deeply rooted in the culture and spirituality of ancient societies. It was believed that the world was filled with spirits, gods, and other supernatural beings, all of whom could influence the lives of humans. The enchantresses were seen as intermediaries, able to communicate with these forces and bend them to their will. They were the keepers of ancient knowledge, passed down through generations, often in secret, to protect it from those who would misuse it. In the hands of an enchantress, a simple herb could become a powerful potion, a chant could become a spell, and a dream could become a prophecy. They understood the language of nature, the signs in the stars, and the messages carried by the wind. Their wisdom was sought after by kings and commoners alike, for in times of crisis, when all else failed, it was the enchantress who held the last hope. But this power also made them targets. To be an enchantress was to live in a world that feared what it did not understand. The same societies that depended on their magic were quick to turn on them in times of trouble. Droughts, plagues, failed crops, anything that could not be easily explained was often blamed on the enchantresses. They were accused of bringing curses, of consorting with demons, of threatening the very fabric of society. The term which itself is steeped in history and myth. In ancient times, it was not always a term of reproach. In some cultures, it was a title of respect, a recognition of a woman's power and wisdom. In others, it was a label used to control and condemn. A witch was a woman who did not conform, who did not bow to the rules of society, who claimed a power that was her own. She was a threat to the established order, and as such, she had to be silenced. But no matter the name they were given, witches, sorceresses, enchantresses, these women were united by their connection to the unseen. They were the healers, the midwives, the wise women who lived on the outskirts of society, both literally and figuratively. They were the ones who stood at the crossroads, who could see both the light and the dark, and who understood that one could not exist without the other. As time passed, the image of the enchantress began to change. The stories that were once whispered in all became twisted into tales of horror. The church, seeking to assert its power, began to demonize these women, turning them into symbols of evil. The once respected enchantress became the wicked witch, her power a sign of her pact with the devil. The fear that had always surrounded them now became a weapon used to destroy them. But even in the face of persecution, the spirit of the enchantress could not be crushed. She continued to live on, in the stories passed down through generations, in the rituals that survived in secret, and in the hearts of those who still sought her wisdom. 
She became a symbol of resistance, of the power of the feminine, of the connection between humanity and the natural world. The enchantresses of antiquity were more than just characters in ancient myths. They were real women, living in a world that both needed and feared them. They walked the line between the known and the unknown, carrying the weight of their power with grace and strength. And though their names may be forgotten, their legacy lives on, in the whispers of the wind, in the rustling of the leaves, and in the stories that continue to be told. In the end, the Enchantress is not just a figure of the past. She is a reminder of the power that lies within us all, the power to connect with the world around us, to heal, to protect, and yes, even to destroy. She is a symbol of the eternal struggle between fear and understanding, between the light and the dark, and between the world that is and the world that could be. And as long as there are those who seek to understand the mysteries of the world, the Enchantress will never truly be forgotten. Circe, the name alone stirs something ancient and powerful deep within the soul. On a lonely island, shrouded by the mists of the Aegean Sea, lived a woman of unimaginable power. She was neither goddess nor mortal, but something in between, a being who danced on the edge of both worlds. The winds whispered her name, the waves carried her story, and sailors who dared to cross her path often never returned to tell the tale. Her name was Circe, the sorceress of Aiaia, and her legend would echo through the ages. Circe's tale is one of magic and transformation, of the delicate line between kindness and cruelty. Born to the sun god Helios and the ocean nymph Perse, Circe was a child of light and water, yet her heart was not bound by the gentle nature of her mother nor the blazing power of her father. She was different from the other gods, an outsider even among her own kind, and this difference would shape her destiny in ways that neither she nor the world could have ever foreseen. On her island of Aiaia, Circe's powers flourished. The island itself was a place of wild beauty, where the flowers bloomed with unnatural vibrancy and the air hummed with the presence of unseen forces. It was here, in this isolated haven, that Circe mastered the art of enchantment. Her gift was not of brute strength or the wrath of thunder, but something far more subtle and profound, the ability to transform reality itself. With her potions and spells, Circe could bend the very nature of beings to her will. She could turn men into beasts as easily as one might turn a page in a book. It was said that she could change the course of fate with a single word and that no one who came into her presence could leave unchanged. Her magic was born of the earth and the stars, a blend of natural wisdom and divine knowledge that was hers alone. But Circe's power was not just in her spells. It was in the way she moved through the world and the way she could see through the hearts of men and gods alike. She understood the desires that drove them, the fears that haunted them, and the weaknesses that they tried to hide. And in that understanding, she found her true strength. When Odysseus, the cunning hero of Ithaca, and his men arrived on her shores, they were weary from their long and treacherous voyage. Circe welcomed them into her home, offering them food and drink, but her hospitality came with a dark twist. The wine she poured was laced with a potion that turned Odysseus's men into swine. In that instant, the warriors who had fought bravely in countless battles were reduced to nothing more than animals, their human forms stripped away by Circe's magic. Yet, there was more to Circe's actions than mere cruelty. She saw in these men the greed and violence that had driven them, the same traits that had brought so much suffering to the world. By transforming them into beasts, she revealed the true nature that lay beneath their human skin. But even as she wielded her power with a firm hand, there was a softness in her heart that could not be fully hidden. When Odysseus, protected by the herb moly given to him by the god Hermes, confronted her, Circe saw something different in him. He was not like the others, he was clever, brave, and most importantly, he had a heart that could still feel compassion. Instead of turning him away, she invited him into her bed, and for a time, they became lovers. It was said that in those moments, Circe let down her guard, allowing herself to be vulnerable in a way she had never been before. Their love affair was brief, but it changed Circe. She released Odysseus's men from their enchantment, restoring them to their human forms, and helped the hero with his quest to return home. In doing so, she revealed another side of her nature, a side that was capable of mercy and kindness, even after centuries of solitude and mistrust. 
Circe's story in the Odyssey is one of power, yes, but it is also one of loneliness, longing, and the search for connection. She was a woman who had the world at her fingertips, and yet she was alone, surrounded by the creatures she had created, but devoid of true companionship. Her power isolated her, making her both feared and untouchable, and in that isolation, she found both her strength and her sorrow. Through the centuries, Circe's legend has endured, shaping the image of the witch in the minds of countless generations. She became the archetype of the Enchantress, a woman whose power came not from brute force, but from the mastery of subtle and transformative magic. Her story influenced later tales of witches and sorceresses, from the medieval stories of witches who could turn men into beasts, to the modern portrayals of powerful women who are both feared and misunderstood. Circe was not just a figure of myth, but a symbol of the complex nature of power itself. Her magic was a double-edged sword, capable of both harm and healing, and her story reminds us that the line between the two is often blurred. She was a woman who knew the full extent of her power, but also the weight of its consequences, and in that knowledge, she found both her curse and her salvation. Her legend lives on, in the waves that crash against the shores of Aiaia, in the whispers of the wind that carries her name and in the hearts of those who seek to understand the true nature of power and transformation. Circe's story is not just a tale of ancient magic, but a timeless reminder of the strength that lies within, and the price that must often be paid to wield it. Medea was a woman of extraordinary power, but her story is one that bleeds with sorrow and betrayal. Born the granddaughter of Helios, the sun god, she carried the blood of gods within her veins. Yet, it was not her divine lineage that defined her, but the love she gave and the pain she endured. Her life was a tangled web of love, magic, and a vengeance so fierce that it echoes through time. Medea's love for Jason was all-consuming. When he arrived in Calchas, seeking the Golden Fleece, she was struck by his presence. He was not just any man, he was a hero on a quest, and she, a young woman with unimaginable power, was captivated by his bravery and determination. But this love would be her undoing. She used her magic to help him, betraying her own father and her homeland for the sake of a love that burned too brightly. Her powers were formidable, she knew the secrets of herbs and potions, could summon the winds and manipulate the natural world to her will. She was a master of spells, able to bend the very forces of life and death. It was she who tamed the fire-breathing bulls, sowed the dragon's teeth that sprouted into warriors, and drugged the serpent that guarded the golden fleece. Without her, Jason's quest would have ended in failure, and yet, he saw her not as an equal but as a tool, a means to an end. They fled together, Medea leaving behind her father, her home, and even her younger brother, whom she sacrificed to ensure their escape. It was a betrayal that would haunt her, a dark stain on her soul that could never be washed away. For Jason, she had given up everything, and in return, she believed that she had won his love. But love built on such foundations is fragile, and it was not long before the cracks began to show. In Corinth, they made a life together, and Medea bore Jason two sons. But the warmth of family life was not enough for Jason. Ambition burned in his heart and he sought a new alliance that would secure his power, a marriage to Glossy, the daughter of King Creon. Medea, who had given him everything, was cast aside like a broken tool. The pain of his betrayal was more than she could bear, a searing wound that cut deeper than any sword. The betrayal twisted something inside Medea. The love that had once filled her heart turned to a bitter and consuming hatred. Her mind, sharp and powerful, turned to thoughts of revenge. Jason had taken everything from her, and in return, she would take everything from him. Her revenge would be terrible, and it would be final. Medea's heart was hardened, and she used the very skills that had once saved Jason to destroy him. She crafted a beautiful robe and a golden crown, laced with a poison so deadly that it would burn flesh and bone alike. She sent these gifts to Glossy, who, upon donning them, was consumed by flames that could not be extinguished. The fire that had once symbolized Medea's love now became a symbol of her vengeance. But Medea's revenge did not stop with Glossy. The same twisted love that had driven her to betray her own family now drove her to commit the most unimaginable act. 
She killed her own children, the son she had born with Jason, knowing that in doing so, she would cause him a pain that would never heal. It was an act of such horror that it left even the gods aghast. In one terrible moment, Medea became both mother and murderer, her heart breaking even as she wielded the knife. Yet, Medea was not defeated. In the midst of her sorrow and rage, she remained a figure of power. She fled Corinth in a chariot drawn by dragons, escaping the consequences of her actions, leaving Jason to face the ashes of his life alone. She returned to Athens, where she found refuge with King Aegeus, and later, to Calchas, her homeland, where she reclaimed her throne. But no matter where she went, the shadows of her past followed her, a constant reminder of the love that had turned to hate, and the power that had brought both salvation and ruin. Medea's story is one of the most tragic in all of mythology. It is the tale of a woman who loved too deeply, who sacrificed too much, and who, in the end, lost everything. Her powers, which should have brought her happiness and fulfillment, instead brought her only pain and destruction. She was a victim of her own heart, her love for Jason turning her into a monster, and her magic, once a gift, becoming a curse. Yet, even in her darkest moments, Medea remained a figure of awe. She was a woman who refused to be broken, who took control of her own destiny, no matter the cost. She was both heroine and villain, both victim and perpetrator. Her story is a reminder of the dangerous power of love and the tragic consequences that can arise when that love is betrayed. Medea's legend has endured for thousands of years, not just because of her magic, but because of the raw, emotional power of her story. She was a woman who loved with all her heart, who gave everything she had for that love, and who, when it was taken from her, unleashed a wrath so terrible that it still resonates today. Her story is not just one of myth, but one of the darkest and most profound truths of the human experience. Under the silver light of the moon, where shadows stretch and darkness whispers, there stands a figure who embodies the very essence of mystery and power, Hecate, the triple goddess of witchcraft. She is not bound by the ordinary, her presence felt in the stillness of midnight and at the crossroads where decisions are made. She is the one who watches over those who walk between worlds, a protector and guide, feared and revered in equal measure. Hecate's origins are as enigmatic as the moon she is so closely tied to. Born of the Titans, she was a goddess of immense power, her dominion stretching over the earth, sea, and sky. But it was the night that truly belonged to her, the time when her strength was at its peak. The moon, ever-changing, reflected the many faces of Hecate, from the maiden full of potential to the mother in her nurturing power, and finally to the crone, wise and knowing, holding the secrets of the universe in her hands. She was the guardian of the crossroads, those liminal spaces where the veil between worlds is thin, where choices are made that shape destinies. It was here, at these crossroads, that her worshippers would leave offerings, hoping for her favor. Hecate was not a goddess of simple kindness, she was a force to be reckoned with, her gifts coming with the weight of responsibility. She could guide a soul to safety, or lead them into darkness, her favor was not easily won, but once given, it was powerful and unbreakable. In ancient Greece, Hecate was the goddess that witches turned to in their rituals, the one who granted them the power to see beyond the ordinary, to command the forces of nature and spirit alike. She was the one who taught them the ways of magic, her influence felt in every spell cast under the moonlight. Witches saw in Hecate a reflection of their own power, their own ability to stand on the edge of the world and reach into the unknown. She was their protector, their teacher, and their inspiration. Hecate's connection to the moon was more than symbolic. The phases of the moon mirrored her own cycles, her energy waxing and waning with the lunar tides. When the moon was full, so too was Hecate's power at its peak, a time when spells were strongest and the barriers between worlds thinnest. During the dark of the moon, when the sky was empty, Hecate's energy turned inward, a time for reflection, for connecting with the deepest parts of the soul. It was in these moments that witches would call upon her to guide them through their darkest thoughts, to help them find the light within the shadows. Her image has evolved over the centuries, but her essence remains the same, a goddess of the in-between, of transformation, of the magic that lies just beyond the edge of what is known. 
In some traditions, she is depicted as a crone, her face lined with the wisdom of ages, her eyes filled with the knowledge of all that has been and all that will be. In others, she appears as a young maiden, her beauty is captivating as it is terrifying, for it is a beauty that knows the price of power. Hecate's power was not just in her ability to guide or protect, but also in her understanding of the duality of life and death. She was present at the birth of life, and she was there at the end, her presence a constant reminder that all things are connected, that the end is but a new beginning. It is said that she held the keys to the underworld, that she could open the gates for those who had passed and guide them safely to the other side. In this, she was not a figure of fear, but of comfort, a beacon in the dark for souls lost in the shadows. Worship of Hecate was not confined to the ancient world. Her image has persisted, her power still felt by those who honor her today. In modern traditions, she is often invoked in rituals of protection, in times of change, or when one stands at a crossroads, unsure of which path to take. She is the goddess of witches, of those who walk their own path, who seek the wisdom of the old ways and the strength to forge their own destinies. Her name carries with it a weight, a sense of the sacred and the unknown. To call upon Hecate is to invite her presence into one's life, to stand at the crossroads and ask for her guidance. It is to acknowledge the power of the night, the magic of the moon, and the wisdom of the ages. She is not a goddess who is easily understood, for her mysteries are deep, her power vast, and her influence felt in the very fabric of the world. Hecate's story is one of resilience, of transformation, and of the eternal connection between the known and the unknown. She is the guardian of the thresholds, the one who stands at the edge of what is and what could be, holding the keys to both. Her legacy is one of strength and wisdom, a reminder that there is power in the dark, and that sometimes, the path forward is found not in the light of day, but in the shadows of night. In the heart of ancient Egypt, where the Nile's waters flowed like veins through the land, there stood a goddess whose power was unmatched, whose wisdom and magic shaped the destiny of gods and men alike. Isis, the divine sorceress, was more than just a figure of worship, she was a force of nature, a beacon of hope, and a symbol of undying love. Her story is one of devotion, of relentless pursuit, and of a magic so potent it could defy even death itself. Isis was born among the gods, yet her heart was bound to the world of mortals. She was the daughter of Gib, the god of the earth, and Nut, the goddess of the sky. But it was her love for her husband, Osiris, that truly defined her. Osiris, the god of the afterlife, was the center of her world, and together they ruled with justice and wisdom. But their happiness was not to last, for in the shadows lurked Set, the god of chaos and destruction, whose jealousy knew no bounds. Set's treachery struck like a venomous serpent, shattering the peace of the divine realm. He murdered Osiris, tearing his body into pieces and scattering them across the land. In that moment, the world of Isis was plunged into darkness, her beloved taken from her by the cruel hand of fate. But Isis was not one to succumb to despair. Her love for Osiris burned too brightly, her magic too powerful to be extinguished. With a heart full of sorrow and a resolve as strong as the pyramids, Isis embarked on a quest to find the pieces of Osiris's body. She scoured the land, using her magic to guide her, her tears mingling with the Nile's waters as she searched. Each piece she found was a victory against the forces of chaos, a testament to her unwavering love. And when at last she had gathered them all, she performed a ritual that would become the stuff of legends. Calling upon all her magical powers, Isis breathed life back into Osiris. The winds of the desert stilled, the stars seemed to hold their breath as the god of the afterlife stirred once more. In that moment, Isis became more than a goddess, she became the very embodiment of resurrection, of the triumph of life over death. Her magic had defied the natural order, her love had conquered even the finality of the grave. But Isis's power was not only in resurrection. She was a goddess of wisdom, her knowledge of the magical arts unparalleled. She was the one who knew the secrets of the universe, who could command the elements, who could heal the sick and protect the innocent. Her worshippers would invoke her name in times of need, trusting in her ability to bring them through the darkest of times. Isis was the mother who nurtured, the healer who mended, the sorceress who wielded power with grace and compassion. 
Her story with Osiris did not end with his resurrection. Together, they conceived a son, Horus, who would go on to avenge his father and reclaim the throne from Set. In this, Isis was not just a wife or mother, she was the protector, the one who ensured the continuation of the divine lineage. Her strength was not only in her magic, but in her ability to endure, to persevere in the face of overwhelming odds. Isis's influence extended far beyond Egypt's borders. She was revered in Rome, Greece, and beyond, her image becoming synonymous with the archetype of the Divine Mother, the Protector, the Wise Woman. Temples were built in her honor, and her worship spread throughout the ancient world, her name whispered in prayers by those seeking healing, wisdom, and protection. Her magic, once bound to the Nile, now flowed through the hearts of people across civilizations. In art, Isis was often depicted with a throne-shaped crown on her head, symbolizing her status as the queen of the gods. In her hands, she held an ankh, the symbol of life, and a scepter, a mark of her power. But perhaps the most iconic image of Isis is that of her with outstretched wings, a guardian over the dead, a protector of the living. These wings, both gentle and strong, encapsulate the essence of Isis, her ability to shelter and to fight, to comfort and to challenge. Isis's story is one of love's triumph over death, of wisdom's victory over ignorance, of magic's power to transcend the physical world. Her legacy is not just in the myths that have been passed down through the ages, but in the hearts of those who continue to find inspiration in her story. She is the eternal sorceress, the goddess who wields power with grace, who turns tragedy into triumph, who takes the broken pieces of the world and makes them whole again. In the mist-shrouded halls of Camelot, where knights spoke of honor and kings ruled with might, there was one figure who moved like a shadow, her name whispered in both awe and fear, Morgan Le Fay. She was more than a mere sorceress, she was a woman of contradictions, a being of light and dark, whose powers could heal or destroy. Her story is one of complexity, where the lines between good and evil blur, and where love and revenge dance a dangerous waltz. Morgan Le Fay, the half-sister of King Arthur, was born of noble blood, yet her path diverged from the chivalrous ideals that Camelot held dear. Her early life was marked by a sense of otherness, an understanding that her destiny was not tied to the golden throne, but to the ancient magic that pulsed beneath the surface of the world. She was a healer, trained in the arts of herbalism and enchantment, her hands capable of mending what was broken, her touch a balm for the weary soul. But within Morgan, there was also a storm, a darkness that simmered beneath her calm exterior. Her magic, while capable of healing, could also be twisted into a weapon of manipulation and control. She was a master of illusions, her spells weaving webs of deceit that could ensnare even the wisest of men. This duality defined her, she was both the savior and the seductress, the protector and the betrayer. In the tales of Arthurian legend, Morgan's relationship with King Arthur is one of the most tragic and complex. As his sister, she loved him, yet she also harbored resentment, a bitterness born of neglect and betrayal. The love she once felt turned to a cold determination to bring him down, to see him fall from the pedestal upon which he had been placed. Her actions were not born of simple malice, but of a deep, wounded pride, a desire to reclaim the power and respect she believed was rightfully hers. Morgan Le Fay's role as a healer is often overshadowed by her more malevolent deeds, yet it is this aspect of her that reveals the true depth of her character. She was not a villain in the traditional sense, she was a woman who had been wronged, whose choices were shaped by the pain she had endured. When she used her magic to heal, it was an expression of the love she still carried, a love that could never fully be extinguished, no matter how deeply she tried to bury it. But it was in her role as a manipulator that Morgan Le Fay truly became a figure of legend. Her plots against Arthur and his knights were crafted with a cunning that was unmatched, her schemes unfolding like a carefully laid game of chess. She was always one step ahead, her mind a labyrinth of strategies and contingencies. And yet, despite her brilliance, there was always a sense of tragedy about her, a recognition that her actions, no matter how justified in her mind, would ultimately lead to her own downfall. In the medieval literature that immortalized her, Morgan Le Fay is portrayed in many lights, sometimes as a villain, sometimes as a misunderstood heroine. In some tales, she is the epitome of evil, a witch who seeks only to destroy. 
In others, she is a woman wronged, her actions a response to the injustices she has suffered. But in all these stories, one thing remains constant, her power. Morgan Le Fay was not a woman to be trifled with, her magic is formidable as her will. Her influence extended beyond the realm of Camelot. In later traditions, Morgan Le Fay became a symbol of the dangerous allure of the mystical, a cautionary tale of what happens when one strays too far from the path of righteousness. Yet, there was also a fascination with her, a recognition that she embodied the complexities of the human soul, its capacity for both great good and great evil. Morgan Le Fay's story is one of a woman who refused to be defined by the men around her, who carved out her own destiny with the tools she had been given. She was not content to stand in the shadows, she demanded to be seen, to be heard, to be feared. Her magic was her voice, her way of asserting her power in a world that sought to silence her. And though her actions were often dark, they were always driven by a sense of purpose, a belief that she was owed something more than what she had been given. In the end, Morgan Le Fay's legacy is one of complexity and contradiction. She was both the healer and the manipulator, the loving sister and the vengeful sorceress. Her story is a reminder that power is never simple, that it can be both a blessing and a curse. And in her, we see the reflection of our own struggles, the desire to be loved, the pain of betrayal, and the lengths we will go to claim what we believe is rightfully ours. Morgan Le Fay may have been a witch, but she was also a woman, with all the strengths and weaknesses that entails. Her magic was her shield, her sword, and ultimately, her undoing. In the wild and rugged landscapes of Scotland and Ireland, where the winds howled like ancient spirits and the mountains stand tall as silent witnesses to the passage of time, there is a figure who reigns over the cold and the dark. She is the Kalich, the Winter Witch, a being as old as the earth itself. Her presence is felt in the biting chill of winter's breath, in the frost that clings to the ground, and in the storm clouds that gather ominously above. The Kalich is not just a goddess, she is the embodiment of the harsh, unyielding power of nature. The Kalich's story is woven into the very fabric of Celtic mythology, where she is both revered and feared. She is the guardian of the land, the keeper of the seasons, and the bringer of winter. With a single touch, she can freeze rivers, turn fertile fields into barren wastelands, and cover the world in a blanket of snow. Her power is absolute, her control over the weather and the seasons unchallenged. It is said that she creates the mountains by dropping rocks from her apron, and when she is angered, her fury is unleashed in fierce storms that lash the land. But the Kalich is more than just a bringer of cold and darkness. She is a paradox, a being of contradictions. While she is the harbinger of winter, she is also a creator, a force of life as well as death. The Kalich shapes the land with her hands, sculpting the hills and valleys, and when winter gives way to spring, she retreats, her power waning as the world comes back to life. Yet, her presence never truly fades. She lingers in the shadows, waiting for the time when the earth will once again bow to her will. In Scottish and Irish folklore, the Kalich is a figure of both awe and dread. She is often depicted as an old woman, her skin blue with cold, her hair white as snow. Her eyes are sharp and piercing, like the icy winds she commands. To see the Kalich is to know that winter is coming, that the warmth of summer is but a fleeting memory. Yet, despite her fearsome reputation, there is a deep respect for the Kalich, for she is not evil, she is necessary. Her role is to maintain the balance, to ensure that the cycle of life and death continues. Without winter, there can be no spring, and without the Kalich, the natural order would be thrown into chaos. The Kalich's influence extends far beyond the weather. She is also associated with sovereignty and the land itself. In some stories, she is a goddess who bestows kingship, her favor determining who will rule and who will fall. In others, she is a shapeshifter, able to take on the form of a beautiful maiden or a fearsome crone. This duality reflects the Kalich's connection to the earth, which is both nurturing and unforgiving. She is the wildness of nature personified, untamed and unstoppable. Throughout the centuries, the Kalich has remained a powerful figure in the folklore of Scotland and Ireland. Her stories have been passed down through generations, told around hearths as the wind howls outside. Even today, 
Her presence is felt in the changing of the seasons, in the first frost of autumn, and in the last snow of spring. The Kalich endures, a symbol of the eternal cycle of life and death, of the cold that must come before the warmth. To understand the Kalich is to understand the land she rules. She is the embodiment of winter, the season of rest and reflection, when the earth sleeps and prepares for renewal. But she is also the reminder that life is fragile, that the forces of nature are beyond human control. The Kalich is a reminder of the power and beauty of the natural world, a force that can be both terrifying and awe-inspiring. In the end, the Kalich is a figure who defies easy definition. She is a goddess, a witch, a creator, and a destroyer. She is the cold wind that bites at your skin, the snow that blankets the world in silence, and the storm that rages in the night. But she is also the protector of the land, the one who ensures that life continues, even in the darkest of times. The Kalich is the winter witch, and her story is as enduring as the mountains she created. In the deep, dark forests of Eastern Europe, where the trees stand tall and the shadows seem to move with a life of their own, there is a figure whose name sends shivers down the spine of anyone who dares to speak it. Baba Yaga, the fearsome witch of Slavic folklore, is a being like no other. Her story is one of contradictions, of fear and fascination, of life and death intertwined in the tangled roots of the ancient wood she calls home. Baba Yaga is a creature of the wild, an old woman with a crooked nose, iron teeth, and eyes that burn with a cold, unearthly light. She is often seen flying through the air in a mortar, using a pestle to steer, while sweeping away her tracks with a broom made of silver birch. Her house, perched on giant chicken legs, spins around on command, hiding her from those who seek her out. The house itself is a symbol of Baba Yaga's ambiguous nature, part dwelling, part living creature, always on the move, just as she is. To the villagers who live on the edges of the forest, Baba Yaga is both a terror and a guardian. Children are warned to stay away from her domain, for she is known to devour those who wander too close. Yet, she is also sought after, for Baba Yaga holds great wisdom and power. Those brave or desperate enough to seek her out may find their wishes granted, but only if they can survive the trials she sets before them. For Baba Yaga does not give her gifts freely, they must be earned, often at great cost. Baba Yaga's connection to the forest is more than just a matter of location, it is an expression of her very essence. The forest, like Baba Yaga, is a place of both danger and refuge. It is where life and death meet, where the cycle of nature is most apparent. The trees, the animals, the very earth itself, all are under Baba Yaga's sway. She is the mistress of the woods, a force of nature as wild and unpredictable as the storms that shake the leaves from the branches. Yet Baba Yaga's role in Slavic folklore is not merely that of a villain or a monster. She is also a symbol of transformation, of death and rebirth. In many tales, those who face Baba Yaga emerge changed, often reborn in some way. She is a gatekeeper, standing at the threshold between the known world and the unknown, between life and the afterlife. To encounter Baba Yaga is to be tested, to face the darkness within oneself and to emerge stronger, or to be consumed by it. Baba Yaga's ambiguous nature is perhaps what makes her so compelling. She is neither wholly good nor wholly evil, but something in between, something ancient and untamable. Her actions may seem cruel, but they often serve a purpose, teaching lessons that are harsh but necessary. She is the embodiment of the harsh realities of life, where nothing is given without a price and where the line between life and death is as thin as a thread. In Russian and Eastern European witchcraft, Baba Yaga's influence is profound. She is seen as a powerful witch, a source of knowledge about the old ways, about herbs, potions, and the secrets of the earth. Her connection to the natural world makes her a figure of reverence among those who practice the ancient arts. Yet, she is also feared, for her power is vast, and her motives are inscrutable. To invoke Baba Yaga is to call upon the forces of nature itself, forces that are not easily controlled or understood. Throughout the centuries, Baba Yaga has remained a central figure in Slavic folklore, her legend passed down from generation to generation. She has appeared in countless stories, her image evolving but never losing its power. Even today, 
in the modern world, Baba Yaga continues to captivate the imagination, a reminder of the wild, untamed forces that still linger in the dark corners of the earth. Baba Yaga is not just a character in a story, she is a presence, a force that exists beyond the pages of a book or the words of a tale. She is the wind that rustles the leaves in the dead of night, the creak of branches as something moves just out of sight, the feeling of being watched when you are alone in the woods. Baba Yaga is the fear of the unknown, the lure of forbidden knowledge, the understanding that to gain wisdom, one must be willing to face the darkness. In the end, Baba Yaga is as much a part of the forest as the trees themselves. She is the spirit of the wild, untamed and eternal, a being who defies easy categorization. To know Baba Yaga is to know the forest, to feel the heartbeat of the earth beneath your feet, to understand that life and death are not opposites, but part of the same cycle. Baba Yaga is the witch of the woods, and her story is one that will continue to be told as long as the forest stands and the winds blow through its ancient boughs. In the dim corners of ancient texts and shadowy legends, there lurks a figure whose story is both haunting and powerful. Lilith, the first witch of Jewish mythology, emerges from the darkness with a tale that has fascinated and frightened for centuries. Her origins are wrapped in defiance and transformation, painting her as a symbol of rebellion and strength. Lilith's story begins in the earliest chapters of creation, when she was not the wife of Adam but rather his first partner. In a world where the air was thick with expectation and silence, Lilith was created as Adam's equal, a being as powerful and independent as he. But where Adam was the embodiment of order and authority, Lilith was the spirit of freedom and equality. Their union was meant to be harmonious, but it was soon marred by conflict. Lilith would not submit to Adam's dominance, nor would she accept a place beneath him. Her refusal to be subservient led to a confrontation that set the stage for her dramatic transformation. When Lilith defied Adam, she was cast out of the Garden of Eden, banished to the dark corners of the world where she would become a symbol of forbidden power. Her transformation from Adam's first wife to a demoness is both tragic and empowering. No longer a mere partner, Lilith took on a new role as a figure of strength and autonomy, but also one of darkness and fear. In the barren wastelands and desolate spaces, she became a creature of legend, her name whispered in the same breath as the terrors of the night. Lilith's new identity was not simply that of a demoness, but also of a being who defied the norms of her time. As a demoness, she was often depicted with wings and long hair, a figure that seemed to float between the realms of reality and myth. Her eyes glowed with the fiery intensity of someone who had broken free from the constraints of a world that sought to control her. Lilith became a symbol of female empowerment, a testament to the strength of a woman who chose to live on her own terms, even if it meant living in the shadows. In the folklore that surrounds Lilith, she is often portrayed as a figure of seduction and danger. Her name became synonymous with the night and the unknown, with the dark side of human desires and fears. Yet, this portrayal also reflects a deeper truth. Lilith is a representation of the fierce independence that was often feared and misunderstood. Her legend grew to include tales of her taking vengeance on those who wronged her, of her roaming the night in search of revenge and justice. In this way, Lilith's story became a powerful narrative of resistance against oppression and a call to embrace one's true self, no matter the cost. Lilith's influence extends far beyond the ancient texts in which she first appeared. In later occult traditions, she emerged as a powerful figure associated with magic and witchcraft. Her story was adopted by various groups seeking to reclaim her image as a symbol of empowerment and strength. She became a muse for those who felt marginalized or oppressed, a reminder that true power often comes from embracing one's own nature, no matter how the world may judge it. The feminist movements of the modern era also found a powerful icon in Lilith. Her story resonated with those who saw in her a reflection of their struggles against societal norms and expectations. Lilith became a symbol of women who fought for their rights and their freedom, who refused to be silenced or diminished. Her legend served as a potent reminder that the quest for equality and respect often involves standing against the tide of conventional expectations. Through centuries of transformation and reinterpretation, Lilith has remained a figure of fascination and inspiration. Her story, filled with both darkness and light, 
continues to captivate those who seek to understand the complex interplay between power, freedom, and identity. Lilith, the first witch of Jewish mythology, is not just a figure from ancient texts, she is a timeless emblem of the struggle for self-determination and the enduring strength of the human spirit. In the heart of the ancient world, amid whispers of forbidden arts and shadowy rituals, there is a story that sends a chill through the soul. It is the tale of the Witch of Ender, a figure whose name is forever etched in the annals of biblical history. Her story, cloaked in mystery and fear, reveals a moment when the veil between the living and the dead was pierced by a single act of dark sorcery. The Witch of Ender is known primarily through a dramatic episode recounted in the Bible. During a time of great turmoil for King Saul of Israel, when the weight of his kingdom and the burden of his decisions became too great to bear, he found himself seeking answers in the most unlikely of places. Samuel, the prophet and advisor who had once guided him, was long dead, and Saul's heart was heavy with uncertainty. Desperate and cornered, he turned to the only remaining path he had, the dark, forbidden world of necromancy. The Witch of Ender lived in a realm of shadows and secrets, her home a place where few dared to tread. She was known for her ability to summon spirits from beyond, a practice condemned by the laws of Israelite society. Despite the ban on witchcraft and the fear it inspired, her reputation as a medium was well established. Her power was whispered about in hushed tones, her name carrying the weight of both dread and curiosity. On a fateful night, King Saul, disguised to avoid detection, sought out the Witch of Ender. He arrived in the dead of night, cloaked in darkness, his heart pounding with fear and anticipation. As he approached, the witch, sensing the gravity of his request, knew that this would be no ordinary summoning. Saul asked her to call forth the spirit of Samuel, hoping that the deceased prophet could offer guidance in his time of dire need. With trembling hands and a voice barely above a whisper, the witch began her incantations. The air grew thick with a palpable sense of foreboding as the room was filled with an eerie light. The spirit of Samuel emerged, a ghostly figure hovering between worlds. The encounter was both awe-inspiring and terrifying, a moment when the boundaries of life and death were blurred. Samuel's appearance was a testament to the witch's formidable power, and Saul's reaction was one of raw, visceral fear. Samuel's words to Saul were harsh and unyielding. He delivered a prophecy of doom, revealing that Saul's kingdom would fall and that his fate was sealed. The words were a cruel twist of the knife, a confirmation of Saul's worst fears. In that moment, the power of the Witch of Ender was laid bare. She had summoned not just a spirit, but a message from beyond that would shape the course of history. Her ability to bridge the gap between the living and the dead highlighted the potent and dangerous nature of her craft. In ancient Israelite culture, witchcraft was viewed with a mixture of fear, suspicion, and reverence. The practice was strictly forbidden by the laws of Moses, and those who engaged in it were often seen as outcasts or threats. The Witch of Ender's act of summoning Samuel was not merely an act of defiance, but a profound challenge to the established order. Her power was seen as both a curse and a gift, a dangerous force that could reveal hidden truths and challenge the very fabric of society. The story of the Witch of Ender remains a haunting testament to the fear and fascination that witchcraft inspired in ancient times. It is a tale that speaks to the depths of human desperation and the lengths to which people will go when faced with uncertainty. The witch's role in summoning Samuel was a dramatic and chilling reminder of the unseen forces that lie just beyond the reach of the living. Her legacy endures in the echoes of her dark magic, a reminder of the thin line between power and peril. The Witch of Ender's story continues to resonate as a symbol of the forbidden and the unknown, a testament to the mysteries that lie beyond the veil of our understanding. In the annals of history, her name remains a chilling reminder of the power that dwells in the shadows and the dark corners of human belief. In the eerie stillness of ancient battlefields and the chilling whispers of the wind, there lurks a figure whose presence evokes both awe and dread. The Morrigan, the Phantom Queen of Celtic lore, is a being of shadow and power whose story cuts through the fabric of time like a blade. Her essence is woven into the very tapestry of fate, death, and prophecy, making her one of the most formidable figures in Irish mythology. The Morrigan's presence is both fierce and enigmatic. 
As a war goddess, she is often depicted with an air of terror and dominance. Her role in battle is not merely to watch, but to actively shape the outcome, casting her influence over the lives and deaths of warriors. She embodies the chaos and bloodshed of war, a deity whose very presence could turn the tide of a fight with her spectral power. The clash of steel and the cries of combat become almost symphonic under her watchful gaze as she shapes the destiny of those who face her. Shapeshifting is one of the Morgan's most captivating traits. Her ability to transform into various forms, whether it be a crow, a wolf, or a beautiful maiden, adds to her mystique and terror. Each shape she takes is a reflection of her dual nature, fierce and nurturing, terrifying and beguiling. When she appears as a crow, she soars over the battlefield, her dark feathers a harbinger of death. In the form of a wolf, she prowls with silent menace. And as a maiden, she can allure and deceive, bending fate to her will. Her connection to fate is as profound as it is unsettling. The Morrigan is not just a spectator, but an active participant in the weaving of destiny. She is known for her prophecies, which often come with a sense of inevitability. Her predictions are chilling, as they are delivered with an air of certainty that can shake even the bravest of souls. The Morrigan's prophecies are not mere words, but visions of what is to come, seen through her eyes that pierce the veil of time and reality. They are whispers that chill the spine and make the heart race with the knowledge of inevitable doom. Death, too, is a domain where the Morgan reigns supreme. She dances on the edge of mortality, her presence felt in the final moments of life. In many stories, her arrival signifies the end, a final embrace of the soul as it leaves the body. The Morgan is both the harbinger and the guardian of death, guiding souls through the transition from life to the afterlife. Her influence extends beyond the battlefield, touching every aspect of existence where death holds sway. The Morrigan's influence on Irish mythology is profound and enduring. Her presence in ancient stories speaks to a time when gods and goddesses walked among mortals, shaping their destinies with the flick of a hand or the whisper of a prophecy. Her legacy is a powerful one, etched into the very fabric of the stories that have been passed down through generations. She represents the dark and mysterious aspects of the divine, a force that commands respect and evokes fear. Her stories continue to resonate with those who seek to understand the complex interplay between fate and free will. The Morrigan's figure is a reminder that the forces of destiny are not easily understood and that even the most powerful beings are subject to the whims of fate. Her legacy is a blend of beauty and terror, a testament to the power of myth and the enduring nature of the divine. In the shadows of ancient lore and the depths of Celtic mythology, the Morrigan stands as a figure of immense power and mystery. Her role as a war goddess, her shape-shifting abilities, and her connection to fate and death make her a compelling and haunting presence. She is a reminder of the dark forces that shape our world and the enduring impact of the gods and goddesses who once walked among us. The Morrigan story is one that continues to captivate and terrify, a chilling echo of the divine that still resonates through the ages. In the fierce glow of battle, where the clash of steel echoes through the air and the cries of warriors rise like a tempest, there are figures that move with a grace and power that defy imagination. The Valkyries, the warrior women of Norse myth, are both awe-inspiring and terrifying, their presence an integral part of the epic tapestry of ancient Scandinavian legend. These enchantresses of battle are not mere warriors, but beings of otherworldly might, wielding both strength and magic. Clad in shining armor and armed with spears, they ride through the skies on majestic horses, their purpose as clear as the wind, to choose the bravest of those who fall in combat. Their role is crucial, for they are the selectors of the slain, determining who will be honored with a place in Valhalla, the great hall of the slain where the honored dead await the final battle of Ragnarok. With an air of mystery and power, the Valkyries move through the chaos of war with an uncanny ability to pick out those who are worthy. As they sweep over the battlefield, their very presence seems to shift the tides of fate. They choose not only who will die, but who will be exalted, their decisions etched in the ruins of destiny. It is said that their choice is guided by a divine will, a purpose that aligns with the grand designs of the gods themselves. Once the Valkyries have selected the fallen, they escort the chosen souls to Valhalla. 
This journey is not just a transition but a passage to eternal honor and glory. Valhalla, the great hall presided over by Odin, is a place of feasting and preparation for the final battle. The Valkyries lead the honored souls to this sacred place, their task both reverent and formidable. They are the guides between life and death, ensuring that the Valiant receive their due reward and are prepared for the battles yet to come. In Norse culture, the Valkyries hold a place of both mystical reverence and powerful symbolism. They are seen as both protectors and arbiters, their role in choosing the slain and guiding souls reflecting the deep connection between battle and the divine. Their image is one of awe and respect, embodying the fierce spirit of the warrior and the enigmatic nature of the divine. They are not only figures of battle but symbols of fate and honor, their actions woven into the very fabric of Norse mythology. Their presence in the sagas and poems of old paints them as both beautiful and fearsome, their magical abilities adding a layer of wonder to their already formidable nature. The Valkyries are often depicted as both ethereal and fierce, their magic enhancing their warrior prowess and adding to their mystique. They are the embodiment of the Norse belief in the close connection between the divine and the mortal, a bridge between the earthly realm and the otherworldly. The Valkyries' role in selecting the slain and guiding souls is a testament to their crucial place in the cosmic order. Their ability to traverse the realms of life and death, to shape the destiny of warriors, speaks to a deep-seated belief in the power of fate and the honor of those who fall in battle. They are the living embodiment of the Norse ideals of valor and glory, their story a powerful reminder of the intertwining of life, death, and the divine. In the misty battlefields of Norse myth, the Valkyries shine as figures of both fear and reverence. Their magical abilities and their role in guiding the fallen to Valhalla paint a picture of divine power and honor. Their legacy endures as a symbol of the fierce spirit of the warrior and the profound connection between the mortal and the divine, their story continuing to captivate and inspire awe across the ages. In the shadows of ancient Greek mythology, there lurks a figure whose story is as haunting as it is tragic. Lamia, once a beautiful queen, is transformed into a nightmarish creature feared across the ages. Her legend is a dark tale of loss and vengeance, a story that intertwines beauty and horror in a way that chills the soul. Lamia was once a queen of immense beauty, captivating all who beheld her. Her allure was not just physical, she was a figure of grace and majesty, the very essence of elegance and charm. Yet, beneath this enchanting exterior lay a tale of profound sorrow and devastating transformation. When Lamia's beauty drew the gaze of the god Zeus, Hera, driven by jealousy and rage, cursed her. This divine punishment twisted Lamia's existence into something grotesque and horrifying. Stripped of her former self, Lamia became a serpentine demon, her once graceful form now a monstrous amalgamation of snake and woman. Her eyes, once a mirror of allure, turned into hollow, fearsome orbs that could send shivers down the spine of even the bravest soul. Her transformation was not merely physical but symbolic. The serpent, often a symbol of treachery and deceit, embodied the deep pain and rage that had consumed her. It was as if the serpent's cold, slithering form represented the icy grip of her grief and vengeance. The most chilling aspect of Lamia's new existence was her horrific thirst for vengeance. Her heartache over the loss of her children led her to a ghastly fate, she became a child-eating demon. The legend tells of how Lamia roams the night, hunting for innocent children to devour, driven by an insatiable hunger born from her own tragic loss. Her sorrow and rage twisted into a monstrous form of revenge, making her a figure of terror in Greek folklore. Lamia's story is a reflection of the ancient Greek fascination with the macabre and the monstrous. Her legend evokes a mixture of fear and pity, illustrating how beauty and grace can be corrupted into something horrifying and unrecognizable. The serpent imagery in her myth symbolizes her transformation from a queen of beauty into a symbol of dread and destruction. It speaks to the deep-seated fears of losing one's humanity and the lengths to which grief and anger can drive a person. The fear surrounding Lamia is palpable, as she represents not just physical horror but a deeper, more emotional terror. The idea of a once beautiful queen now reduced to a creature that preys on children is a haunting reminder of how easily one's life can be shattered by the whims of the gods and the cruelty of fate. 
The myth of Lamia taps into a primal fear, one that resonates through the ages, the fear of losing oneself and becoming something monstrous. Yet, within this fearsome legend, there is also a tragic poignancy. Lamia's story is not merely about a monster, it's about a woman who lost everything and was transformed into something she never wished to be. Her tale is a sorrowful echo of the human condition, a reminder of how devastating loss and betrayal can twist even the most beautiful soul into something unrecognizable. The figure of Lamia continues to captivate and horrify, her legend a powerful testament to the intersection of beauty, sorrow, and monstrosity. Her story endures as a dark and compelling myth, a chilling reminder of the depths of despair and the monstrous forms that grief can take. In the chilling silence of the Norse cosmos, there are three ancient figures whose very presence determines the course of all existence. These are the Norns, the mysterious weavers of fate who hold the threads of destiny in their gnarled hands. Their power is immense, their role crucial, and their story is a haunting reminder of the inescapable nature of fate. The Norns are not just any beings, they are the embodiment of fate itself. They live beside Yggdrasil, the world tree, a towering ash tree that binds the universe together. Here, in the shadow of this great tree, they weave the threads of life, determining the fate of gods, men, and all things in between. Their loam is not like any ordinary loam, it is the fabric of existence, and each thread they weave is a strand of destiny that cannot be altered. The Norns are typically depicted as three sisters, each with a unique role. Ord, the past, inscribes the events that have already occurred. Verdandi, the present, shapes the ongoing moments of life. Skuld, the future, spins the threads of what is yet to come. Together, they form a triad of power that transcends time. They're weaving a cosmic dance that links the past, present, and future. Their work is meticulous and unrelenting. Every action, every choice, every breath is woven into the great tapestry of existence. To see the Norns at work is to understand the profound weight of fate. Their loam is vast and endless, stretching far beyond the reaches of human comprehension. They sit in the murky twilight of the world tree, their hands moving with practiced precision as they spin the threads of life. Their presence is both awe-inspiring and terrifying, for they hold the ultimate power over destiny. The gods themselves are not immune to their influence. Even the mighty Odin, the All-Father, must contend with their weaving, knowing that even his own fate is bound by their threads. The connection between the Norns and witchcraft is as ancient as their own lore. In Norse mythology, witchcraft is often associated with the power to influence fate, a concept deeply intertwined with the Norns' role. The Norse people saw witches, or vulvas, as seers who could glimpse the threads of fate, much like the Norns themselves. These witches were believed to possess the ability to alter or foretell destinies, echoing the Norns' own power over fate. The practice of siege, a form of magic in Norse culture, was closely linked to the Norns, emphasizing the idea that controlling or understanding fate was akin to wielding divine power. The Norns' influence extends beyond their mythological domain. Their story embodies a profound truth, no matter how powerful, how wise, or how determined one might be, the threads of fate are woven and set by forces beyond human control. The fear and respect surrounding the Norns reflect the ancient belief in the inevitability of destiny. Even the gods, for all their might and glory, cannot escape the intricate patterns laid out by these fateful weavers. As the Norns weave, they embody the essence of life's complexities and uncertainties. Their loom is both a symbol of the inevitability of fate and a testament to the intricate beauty of the universe. Their threads, though seemingly random, come together to form a grand design that is both awe-inspiring and humbling. The Norns remind us that while we may strive to shape our own destinies, there are forces beyond our understanding that guide the course of existence. In the shadowy corners of Norse mythology, Angerboda stands as a figure of chilling power and dark prophecy. She is not just a name, but a force of nature, embodying chaos, destruction, and the unyielding grip of fate. Andrabota's tale is woven with the threads of terror and inevitability, marking her as a pivotal character in the tapestry of ancient lore. Andrabota, whose name translates to the one who brings sorrow, is often shrouded in an aura of dread. 
Her role in Norse mythology is inextricably linked to the monstrous progeny she bore, Fenrir, the Great Wolf, Jormungandr, the World Serpent, and Hel, the ruler of the underworld. These children are not merely beings of myth, they are harbingers of doom, each representing an element of cosmic upheaval. Fenrir, destined to bring about Ragnarok with his ravenous hunger, Jormungandr, coiling around the earth in a serpent's embrace, and Hel, presiding over the realm of the dead, are powerful symbols of chaos and destruction. And Grabota's story is not one of passive motherhood, but of active participation in the forces that shape the world. Her connection to these formidable offspring is both a source of fear and a testament to her own formidable power. The myth surrounding Angerboda is a haunting tale of how the primal forces of chaos and darkness are intertwined with the fates of gods and men. She embodies the unsettling reality that even the gods are not free from the destiny woven by the hands of fate. The portrayal of Angerboda reflects her as a powerful and feared witch, a figure whose very presence disrupts the natural order. In ancient Norse texts, she is often depicted as a giantess dwelling in Jotunheim, the land of the giants, a realm associated with chaos and destruction. Her association with this wild, untamed land underscores her role as a force of primordial energy, one that defies the established order of the cosmos. And Grabota is more than just a mother of monsters, she is a symbol of the raw, unrestrained power that exists at the fringes of civilization and order. Her story is also deeply tied to prophecy and the inevitable destruction that it foretells. The Norse sagas speak of a time when Angerboda's children will rise against the gods, leading to the catastrophic end known as Ragnarok. This apocalyptic vision paints Angerboda as not only a bearer of monstrous beings, but as an integral part of the cosmic narrative that leads to the ultimate battle between order and chaos. Her role in this grand narrative is both terrifying and awe-inspiring, a reminder of how deeply interwoven destiny and destruction are in the Norse worldview. And Grabota's legacy is a chilling reminder of the ancient belief that chaos and fate are as vital to the universe as order and creation. She stands as a powerful figure in Norse mythology, embodying the dark forces that drive the cosmos towards its inevitable end. Her children, each a symbol of destruction and change, highlight the terrifying beauty of her influence. And Grabota's story is a somber reflection on the nature of power and fate, capturing the imagination with its blend of darkness and inevitability. In the dense, shadowy forests of ancient Lithuania, the figure of Medina emerges like a mystical spirit, intertwining with the very essence of the wild. Medina is not merely a name but a powerful presence, embodying the untamed beauty and fierce guardianship of the forest. Her mythology paints her as a goddess who commands the woods and the hunt, a protector of nature's delicate balance. Medina's domain is the vast, ancient forest, where every rustling leaf and whispering breeze seems to speak of her presence. In the Lithuanian pagan belief, she is the embodiment of the forest's life force. Her connection to the wilderness is not just symbolic but deeply rooted in the natural world. Medina is often portrayed as a regal, ethereal figure who moves with the grace of a deer and the authority of a queen. She is intimately linked with the animals of the forest, guiding and protecting them with a fierce devotion. As the goddess of the hunt, Medina holds a dual role. She is both a nurturer and a fierce protector, ensuring that the balance of life and death within her forest domain remains undisturbed. Her role is not just about overseeing the hunt, but about maintaining the harmony between humans and nature. Medina teaches respect for the forest and its creatures, embodying the idea that hunting should be done with reverence and care. Her presence ensures that the hunt is carried out ethically, reflecting the deep connection between humans and the natural world. Medina's significance in Lithuanian paganism is profound. She represents the ancient reverence for nature and the wild, a time when forests were seen as sacred spaces inhabited by powerful deities. Her mythology is a reminder of the respect and awe that ancient peoples held for the natural world. Medina is not merely a guardian, but a symbol of the primal, life-sustaining power of the earth. Her worship reflects the deep bond that people once had with their environment, a bond rooted in both spiritual and practical necessity. The forest is not just a backdrop for Medina's story, but a living, breathing entity that pulses with her energy. 
Every part of the forest is seen as sacred, from the towering trees to the smallest creatures that inhabit it. Medina's role as a protector of this sacred space highlights the ancient belief that nature is not something to be conquered but cherished and respected. Her presence in the myths of the Lithuanian people is a testament to the enduring power of nature and the sacred bond between humans and the wild. In the heart of the forest, Medina stands as a living legend, her story echoing through the ancient trees and whispered by the wind. Her role as the goddess of the hunt and protector of the wilderness captures the essence of a time when the natural world was seen as a realm of powerful spirits and sacred forces. Medina is a powerful reminder of the ancient reverence for nature, embodying the wild beauty and untamed spirit of the forest that remains etched in the myths and memories of those who once walked among the trees. In the quiet, sacred chambers of ancient temples, a mystical presence was felt. It was here that the whispers of the divine touched the earthly realm through the voices of the oracles. These priestesses and seers were more than mere humans, they were the conduits between the gods and the mortal world, guiding leaders and commoners alike with their enigmatic prophecies. The ancient Greeks and Romans revered these oracles, understanding their words as direct messages from the divine. The most famous of these were the Pythia and the Sibyls, whose names alone evoked awe and reverence. The Pythia, seated in the temple of Apollo at Delphi, was the most renowned. Clad in her sacred robes, she would enter a trance-like state, inhaling the vapors that arose from the earth and speak in cryptic verses. Her prophecies were sought by kings and ordinary citizens, all eager for a glimpse into the future. To hear her speak was to witness the divine weave of fate and destiny. The Sibyls, too, held a place of immense respect. These seers wandered through the ancient world, their voices carrying warnings and guidance from the gods. Their prophecies were recorded in oracular books, often filled with symbols and riddles that only the most learned could decipher. The Sibyls were seen as a bridge to the sacred, their words laden with the weight of divine authority and the mystery of the unknown. The oracle's role was not confined to merely predicting the future. Their prophecies often intertwined with religious rites and magical practices. They were deeply involved in rituals that sought to placate the gods, seeking their favor or warning of their displeasure. In this sacred space, religious devotion and magical practice fused seamlessly. The oracles would perform rituals, chant hymns, and make sacrifices to ensure that their messages were true and well received by the gods. The prophecies delivered by these revered figures were more than just predictions, they were the threads that wove the tapestry of history. The advice given by the Pythia or the Sibyls could alter the course of empires, influencing decisions of war and peace, governance, and personal fate. Their words carried the power to shape the destiny of nations and individuals alike. Listening to the oracles was an emotional experience that left an indelible mark on those who sought their wisdom. The air would be thick with anticipation as the sacred utterances were interpreted and discussed. The words of the oracles were often ambiguous, leaving room for interpretation and reflection, which only heightened the sense of mystery and reverence surrounding them. In the ancient world, to encounter an oracle was to touch the divine. Their presence and their prophecies were seen as a vital link between the human and the divine, between the known and the unknown. The Pythia and the Sibyls, through their mysterious and often cryptic messages, offered a glimpse into the vast and enigmatic realm of the gods, forever shaping the lives and beliefs of those who sought their guidance. In the ancient heart of Greek mythology, where the threads of fate wove the destiny of gods and mortals alike, three sisters held the power to decide the course of every life. The Moirai, or Fates, were not merely mythic figures, they were the very essence of destiny, crafting the intricate patterns that dictated every joy and sorrow, every rise and fall. Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropus were their names. Clotho spun the thread of life, her spindle twirling the yarn of existence into being. Lachesis measured it, determining the length and the scope of each life's journey. And Atropus, with her sharp shears, snipped the thread at its appointed end, ensuring that no one could escape their fate. This trio, bound by their unyielding duty, stood as the ultimate arbiters of destiny. The Moirai were not just figures of myth, but embodied the very idea of fate and destiny in the ancient world. They wove the tapestry of life with threads of fate that no mortal or god could alter. 
Their influence extended beyond the realm of mere stories, they were integral to the understanding of life itself. To Greeks, the fates were the ultimate embodiment of cosmic order, their decisions immutable and their presence awe-inspiring. The connection between the Morai and witchcraft is profound. These sisters, with their control over destiny, bore a striking resemblance to the power attributed to witches. The Morai's role as controllers of fate paralleled the perception of witches as wielders of magical influence over life's course. Just as witches were believed to have the power to shape or curse destinies, the Morai were seen as the ultimate enforcers of fate, their decisions final and absolute. The influence of the Morai did not end with the ancient Greeks. Their legacy traveled through history, leaving an indelible mark on later European mythology and literature. In medieval and renaissance tales, the fates continued to be depicted as figures who controlled the threads of life and death. The concept of an inescapable destiny, decided by supernatural beings, echoed the Moirai's ancient role. Stories and legends reflected their power and the haunting truth that no matter how powerful or wise one might be, the fate's decisions were beyond reach. The presence of the Moirai in mythology evokes a deep sense of awe and inevitability. Their existence is a reminder of the forces that lie beyond human control, a sobering reflection on the nature of existence and destiny. Their roles, though seemingly harsh, were also deeply profound, offering a sense of order and purpose to the chaos of life. To contemplate the Moirai is to confront the powerful and often unsettling idea that our lives are woven into a pattern beyond our full understanding. The fates, with their threads of life, embody the timeless tension between free will and destiny. Their story is a poignant reminder of the forces that govern our existence and the quiet power they hold over the tapestry of our lives. In the shadowy corners of history, where the lines between fact and myth blur, certain queens have emerged as enigmatic figures shrouded in whispers of witchcraft. Cleopatra of Egypt, Boudicca of the Iceni tribe, and others like them have been painted with strokes of magical influence and dark power, their true stories often obscured by layers of legend and lore. Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt, is often depicted as a sorceress whose allure and power were intertwined with the arcane. Her life, marked by political maneuvering and passionate alliances, became the stuff of myth. In ancient Rome, rumors spread that she used witchcraft to seduce Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, influencing them with more than just her beauty and charm. Her reputation as a witch was not just about her personal enchantments, but also a reflection of how powerful women were perceived and feared. The allure of her magic was a symbol of her immense control and influence, making her an icon of power both admired and feared. Boudicca, the fierce queen of the Iceni tribe, is remembered as a warrior queen who led a rebellion against Roman rule. Her portrayal in history and myth often paints her as a figure of immense strength and vengeance, almost otherworldly in her resolve. The stories that swirl around her include accounts of her using magic to rally her people and instill terror in her enemies. The depiction of Boudicca as a witch serves to emphasize her role as a formidable leader who wielded both political and mystical power. The tales of her sorcery are intertwined with her legacy, illustrating how witchcraft was used as a symbol of resistance and strength. The blending of myth and history in the lives of these queens reveals how the concept of witchcraft was used to navigate the treacherous waters of political power. In times when women held immense power, the label of which often served as both a weapon and a tool. It was a way to explain and sometimes discredit their influence, painting their power as something beyond the natural. For Cleopatra and Boudicca, the mystical aspects of their lives added to their allure and fear, cementing their places in history as figures of awe and intrigue. Witchcraft, in this context, was not merely about casting spells or brewing potions, it was a political tool and a symbol of power. It was used to portray these queens as forces of nature, wielding their authority with a kind of dark magic that transcended ordinary means. The label of witchcraft was a way to frame their power in terms that were both captivating and terrifying, ensuring that their legacies would endure through tales of the supernatural. The image of these queens as witches highlights the deep-seated fears and fascinations surrounding women in power. It reflects a complex interplay between historical reality and the mythic embellishments that have shaped their stories. 
The portrayal of Cleopatra and Boudicca as witches underscores the ways in which powerful women have been mythologized. Their extraordinary capabilities attributed to supernatural forces rather than their own remarkable strengths and skills. These dark queens of history, seen through the lens of witchcraft, become symbols of a deeper narrative about power and gender. Their stories, infused with the magic of myth and the harsh reality of political struggle, continue to captivate and haunt, reminding us of the enduring allure of these remarkable women who wielded power in ways both real and imagined. In the quiet corners of modern life, where whispers of the past meet the pulse of the present, the ancient enchantresses continue to cast their spell. Their legends, woven with threads of magic and mystery, have transcended centuries, influencing contemporary witchcraft and pagan practices with a potent blend of awe and reverence. Consider the ethereal figure of Hecate, her name echoing through the ages. Once a goddess of the underworld and magic, Hecate's image has been revived in modern witchcraft. Her association with the moon, the crossroads, and the mystical arts has inspired countless practitioners who seek to connect with her ancient power. Rituals and ceremonies today are infused with her essence, as those who walk the path of modern witchcraft invoke her name to guide them through dark and light. Hecate's legacy is not just a relic of the past, but a living, breathing part of contemporary magical practice. Similarly, the enigmatic figure of Morgan Le Fay, once feared and revered in Arthurian legend, has found a new place in modern paganism. Her dual nature as both a healer and a manipulator has captivated the imaginations of those who seek to understand the balance of power and compassion. Modern interpretations of Morgan Le Fay often focus on her role as a symbol of feminine strength and wisdom. She is embraced by those who see in her a reflection of the complexities of their own lives, a reminder of the power that lies within. The Kalich, the ancient winter witch of Celtic lore, also breathes new life in today's pagan practices. Her presence as a goddess of the wild and the changing seasons resonates with those who honor the cycles of nature. Modern rituals celebrate her as the embodiment of winter's harsh beauty and the promise of renewal. Her story, steeped in the harshness of winter and the hope of spring, serves as a reminder of the enduring connection between humanity and the natural world. Even the fearsome Baba Yaga, with her hut on chicken legs and her dark, enigmatic power, has captured the contemporary imagination. Her role as a guardian of ancient wisdom and her association with the forest have made her a figure of both dread and respect. In modern witchcraft, Baba Yaga represents the unpredictable nature of magic and the deep mysteries that lie within the natural world. Her legend is invoked by those who seek to embrace the wild, untamed aspects of their spiritual practice. As the ancient enchantresses reemerge in contemporary culture, they bring with them a sense of enduring power and influence. The stories of these legendary women, once confined to the dusty pages of old texts, now dance vividly in the modern imagination. They have become symbols of empowerment and mystery, offering a bridge between the ancient and the present. The resurgence of interest in these figures is not merely a fascination with the past, but a profound recognition of their relevance to today's world. In a time when many seek to reconnect with the deeper aspects of spirituality, these ancient enchantresses provide a source of inspiration and guidance. Their tales offer not only a glimpse into a world of magic and myth, but also a reminder of the power that lies within every individual. The legacy of these ancient women endures not just through their stories, but through the living practices of those who honor them. Their influence on modern witchcraft and paganism speaks to a timeless connection between humanity and the magical forces that shape our world. As the veil between past and present continues to blur, the enchantresses of old remain a beacon of power and inspiration, their legends echoing through the ages and into the heart of contemporary spiritual practice.